presentation this evening on water meters, as you all know. Uh, the way we're going to uh, go through this is uh, I'm going to run through a bunch of slides and uh, give you a bunch of information in terms of uh, what the water, water metering project looks like, why we're doing it, who's paying for it, what the benefits are, and that sort of thing. Uh, we'll have to reserve your questions or discussions until after the presentation. When we're done the presentation, we'll, I'm happy to stand up here and answer questions you have about the program and anything like that. But please reserve your questions and discussions until after the presentation is over. Okay? So, just to get started here, my name is Jake Dublin. I'm the Director of Environmental Services with the Thompson Lake Regional District. Uh, relatively new to the organization, been here three years. Uh, and. Uh, about 20 years in the uh, in the region, actually, worked uh, in various jobs in relation to utilities and that sort of thing. All mostly based out of county, so been in the area for about 20 years. Also here tonight is Tyrone McKay. He's our manager of utility services. He's a short fellow over here on the left. And uh, so his job is to run the 11 water and two wastewater utilities that the TRD owns and operates throughout the region. And uh, so he's dedicated to those 13 utilities. Also here tonight is Renata Perry. She's our water metering project implementation manager. She's been brought on board for roughly a two year period, uh, which is about the amount of time it's going to take to implement metering on all our living water systems. And so if you have questions later on, you want to call, call the office in Kamloops and ask questions about the program, or when you get a letter later on, you want to talk to someone. That's the person you want to speak to. Also here tonight is Steve Cooper, the back here, uh, black jacket. He's project man with Iconics Waterworks. That's the contractor who uh, is successful in completing the contract for supply and installation of water. Here. So that's uh, that's who's here tonight. Okay, I'm sure there's some variety of opinions about water meters in the group. This is not a formal survey, but just out of my own curiosity. Some of you probably think you're good, bad, or you're not sure. Just on a show of hands, I'm just curious. How many of you think water meters are bad? Okay. How many of you are not sure? Okay, that's about 50%. And how many of you think they're a good idea? Yeah. This is pretty similar to most of the other communities we've been at. Uh, you're the seventh community that we've uh, had this presentation in, because as I mentioned, we're doing 11, 11 utilities. So. Uh, that's pretty typical. There's always a mix in the crowd of people who you don't think it's a bad idea. So I'm not sure. A lot of people, a lot of the majority, are a lot, I'm not sure. And, uh, some uh, think it's a good idea. So my job here tonight is to convince those of you that think it's a bad idea or you're not sure that this is not bad news for you. So that's my role here tonight. So hopefully I have some success. But. Okay, uh, this is just a map of the uh, community water systems. There's a community water system. This is uh, it's a bit unique this system in terms of the TNRD system because we run this system jointly with Cook's Ferry Indian Bend. So as many of you are aware that have been here in the community for a long time, Murray Creek way over here on the west end used to be the source of water, primary source of water. That was changed over to three groundwater wells over here at the confluence of the two rivers. Not surprising, that's a good place for wells when you got two rivers coming together. Uh, and so from here, Water is pumped up along this purple line, that's the main uh, water main runs down the road here, and up to the new reservoir, which was actually, let's skip back, that's a photo of the new re newer reservoir, it's not brand new, but it's been in a few years now, but uh, up on the hill. And so that's located right here. And then, of course, the blue lines are distribution mains throughout the community. So, just to give you a picture. Uh, Chris Murray Green Van Reservoir over here, close to the close to the wells. Overall, this is that uh, in comparison to all 11 systems owned and operated by the TNRU, this one's in the top two for sure in terms of good infrastructure and uh, water quality. In case you're wondering. So, what is a water utility? I want to just quickly kind of recap what is a utility because sometimes people would get. Uh, confused about who it, who owns it and what you know who's responsible and all that sort of thing. So 
most all the utilities, particularly the water utilities, are run by local governments. It could be a municipality, it could be a regional district. Paid for, and this is really important, paid for by the users of the system, the customers. I don't pay into the Spencer's Bridge water system. My home doesn't pay into the Spencer's Bridge water system. There's only three sources of funding for running any water utility that owned by the TNRD. First is the rates that you pay, you get your quarterly bill. The second is parcel tax contribution, goes to the utility as well. And the third and only other source of revenue that we have to run, to run and op to operate the system for you is grant funding or gas tax funding, that sort of thing. Basically, money from the province and federal government to help communities operate systems and build things and that sort of thing. That's it. Those are the three sources of funding. Yeah. Utilities are governed under provincial legislation and they are independent <coughs> financial entities. So the money that goes into them stays in that financial entity. It does not get spent somewhere else. It doesn't get transferred in or out to other utilities or other services provided by the regional district. They're independent financial entities. So the best way to think about it is your collective bank account. That's really the best way to think about the utility. Not for profit, clearly, right? The money that gets collected goes directly to the utility's operation maintenance. If any particular year there's a little left over, it stays in the reserve for that utility. It doesn't get shifted out. It's your collective bank account. That's a utility. A few stats on Spencer Bridge system. About 97 connections. Service population about 200 people. Give or take, we don't know the exact number. Average state demand. So this is a year long average, so obviously it's high in the summer, low in the winter. We're going to talk about that some more. 430 cubic meters a day. Per person? 430 cubic meters per day system. for the system. Oh, for the system. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I've got numbers per person too, so uh, that will uh, hopefully answer your question. Uh, the uh, peak day usage is about a thousand something uh, cubic meters per day. Obviously, those are the summer days when it's highest, that sort of thing. So, a lot of water. Average winter days are around 220 cubic meters. So, I have a, see, I've got a bit of a word wrap thing going on here, but average day use per person is 1950 liters per person per day. That's very high. Peak usage over 4,500 meters per person per day. Obviously, that's a huge irrigation component going on here, and uh, I've got some graphs to show you in a bit here. So, what is the additional revenue target from the metering program? How much additional money are we planning to try to get out of the utilities as a result of these water meters? No additional funding. That's not why we're doing this. It has nothing to do with raising more money for the utility. So why, if it's not about raising revenue, why is it a good idea? Before I move on, I'm just going to say we're not going to, you know, future increases will come as a result of inflation. That has nothing to do with whether there's meters or no meters, right? So I'm just adding that. So why water meters? Five reasons I want to talk about, and I'll go into each one of these a little bit one at a time, but just as a recap, there are a couple here. Water conservation, number one reason. Number two reason, fair billing. Number three, leak detection. It's a really nice technology now included in the meters to help us find leaks. Reduced operating costs, which it's your collective bank account, remember? So where there's savings, it's not benefiting me, it's benefiting you as a customer. Increased access to grant funding, really important as well. Okay, I'm going to talk about number one reason, which was water conservation. So, this is just a graph. Bottom line here represents one year long period. So, on the far left here, January 1st, and on the far right, December 31st. And the lines that are going to pop up here represent water usage. So the first line is indoor water use. So it stays pretty even all year long, right? You don't change how much water you use indoors, your laundry and your bathing or whatever else, dishwasher is pretty, pretty constant all year long. So that's why that line is pretty flat, right? It's pretty much the same all year. It varies a little bit. Every system has some leakage on it. Some systems leak more than others. 
Uh, so that's what it represents. So on top of the indoor use, we have leakage. So that's an extra water consumption or water demand on the system that needs to be supplied. Third is outdoor use. So obviously in the winter you're using less water than you are in the summer when you're irrigating your property, your lawn, or your fruit tree, or whatever. And that's really the crux of our challenge with all our systems is to meet what we call maximum day demand. So we can't build a system to not keep up to the biggest demand days. That's what drives everything in our engineering and design and operation of the systems. It's max day demand. That's the number that matters to us. To keep your water flowing every day, right? So maximum demand is the key figure here. So when we add water meters to a system, and this has been proven over and over and over again in lots of communities, Kamloops is a really good recent example over the last eight years. The green line is what happens after you implement meters. You see a big reduction in, in demand in the summer because if people are starting to manage their irrigation needs, and you see very little change, very little change in the winter time, you know, because really the meters don't really have much of an impact, if, if any, during those periods of time, right? So this is why why meters can actually have such a significant impact from operator's perspective, because that max day demand can come down because people are now managing and being encouraged to conserve the water use, right? You have incentive. So this is an actual graph of water usage in Spencer's Bridge over several year cycles. And you saw, you saw that up down during the late summer up and winter down. And there's three, three years on this graph. So the winter use is down here, just over 200, I think it was 220 I had up there earlier. So that's kind of like your winter use. And up here is your max day demand. And up there, as you can see, it bounces around. You, know, you get a you get a couple days of damp weather, obviously there's less water and people in here get less and then it heats up again and you get some, you get some uh, spikes and it goes up and down. So this is the gap, this is the variation here between what really you need, you need for indoors and what you need for outdoors. And in Spencer's Bridge case, about 75% of the capacity of the system is used for irrigation. So really, if you want to think about it, we're running a big irrigation system here that's also used 25% for domestic water, right? But it's the way it is, it's very common, it's, uh, it's almost uniform across Canada. It's extremely rare that you would have separate irrigation and domestic water supplies, so. Anyhow, just wanted to point out that, that's really important in terms of conservation, the benefit of meters. Number two, fair reason for meter, fair billing. Right now, everybody's single family dwelling, right? You're all paying the same flat rate per quarter. So this little diagram is schematic. It just represents a, a roadway here in the middle, and the water main going down the middle of the road. And on one side, you got a small lot over here, and a big lot on the other side. So single-family dwellings. Uh, you know, here's an example of a small single-family dwelling. A couple of people, maybe one or two people in it, a small patch of lawn, or maybe no, next to the lawn. Right across the street, you can have a huge property. Lots of irrigation going on, lots of people, swimming pool maybe, who knows, right? See your edges. These people are paying the same rate. So who's getting the deal here? Right? It's the, 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 the folks that are using lots more are paying the same as the folks that are using a lot less. So it's not fair building, right? So this is another good reason. So single family dwellings are not all consistent. It's, it's more user pay based, right, when we get to a meter system. So that's the second good reason. Leak detection, I mentioned earlier about leak detection. So this is the same drawing, we've got some houses on the street and we've got some close to the road, some further back, some have longer services. So these little squiggly red line arrows here represent leakage. So we get leakage out on our mains in the road. Not that common on the main themselves, but we get them sometimes where the service line takes off from the main to go into the house. Sometimes they leak on you know, the saddle. It's called the connection there is what we call a saddle. And uh, so that's a spot where we sometimes find leaks. So we're, Tyrone and uh, his staff are, you know, they're always trying to locate if there's some leaks. Sometimes we see a spike, and that explains spike in water use. Because we know it's not related to irrigation. Then we, then we go and search more for, for leakage anyway. So we're trying to find and fix those. But there can also be leakage, obviously, on the private property side. 
And we don't go onto people's property and search for leaks there, obviously. So those leaks are uh, often undetected. So these dots, these green dots that I've shown on here, they represent the location of water meters. Water meters can be installed, if you see on the schematics on the side over here, they could be either installed on the property line out, out here in a, in a pit, a small pit. Think of it as like a mini manhole, but you can't put a man in it. Uh, or they can go inside in the house here too. There's various reasons why uh, we're going to have a mixture of water meters. We prefer to put them out on the front property line. That's by far the best place, but it's also a lot more expensive. So in terms of how to set up the project, uh, we're trying to maximize the number of water meter pits that we're putting in, but there's certainly cases where a meter pit isn't going to make sense. Actually, this building is a perfect example of a place that doesn't make sense to put a meter. I mean, it's right on the edge of the road, right? So where are you going to put a meter pit? It doesn't make sense. The meter, wherever the service comes in here, I don't know, I'm guessing over here somewhere, uh, that's where you'd want to put a meter, right? Inside. But in expensive bridge, I think we're at about 90% for now, I believe, in terms of 90% uh, of the pit the meters in expensive bridge will be in small meter pits. And I got pictures of that those coming up so you get a better idea. So, anyway, back to leakage. So, if the meters are located out at the front property line and you have leakage on the private property side, the meters are going to detect that leakage. And not only just in terms of uh, saying, oh, you know, you as a homeowner see my consumption is really high. Well, and actually, sorry, let me back up here. Uh, as long as the leak is downstream of the meter, so that's another advantage of having the meter out here. All the water going into the property gets metered this way, right? So, uh, uh, obviously, the meter indoors is, needs to be installed immediately after the shut off, and I'll show some pictures. But uh, the nice thing about these meters is if they detect flow, in every 15 minute interval for 24 hours, it sends up a, to us a possible leak detection flag. So it comes in with the data, so, uh, which comes up every day, by the way, once every 24 hours. So basically what it is, if you spring a leak, you're going to know it right away, and we're going to know it right away. So it's really helpful from that regard, right? You're going to have, you're going to have access to your data just the same as we have access to it. Uh, everyone will have their own uh, account, and uh, Stephen will talk about more about that more a little bit later here. So leak detection is really helpful. Uh, obviously, if that we can bring down that consumption, then this benefits you. It's your collective bank account, right? So there's the meter flags. You know, we're saying, okay, you got a leak here. The leak water's going through it. If it's flowing every 15 minute interval for 24 hours, the meter says, well, maybe there's a leak on that property. Reduce operating costs. Obviously, you bring down demands. You're going to use less hydro. You're going to have to wear out your equipment less frequently. Uh, you're going to use less, you know, sorry, uh, uh, hypo for chlorination, chemicals, that sort of thing, less maintenance. So, again, we're trying to manage the systems effectively and efficiently as possible to benefit you as a customer. Last reason. A uh, really important one as well, increased access to grant funding. So this photo is just a screen capture off a website. Uh, all the grant programs uh, that have available, uh, are available for utilities to go after and seek funding are managed by the province and the feds pretty much exclusively. And so if we want to do an improvement on a, on a utility, we have to make an a fair, complex application and submit it and hopefully get funding to help make improvements to the systems that uh, they're owned by the TRD. The kicker is there's lots of utilities out there vying for the same dollars. So when these grant programs come up, we're competing against other communities all over BC to try to get the same money. And there's never enough money in any of these programs to supply all the requests that come in from utilities. So we're, we're in competition. And the province and the feds have made it very clear, and they, you can look this stuff up um, if you want to dig down into the, all the details in these grant programs. They uh, encourage and provide or uh, give, put it this way, they want to give their funding to utilities that are conserving and managing the water effectively, 
And the very first thing they look at when you send in an application like this is, is that system metered? If it's not metered and you've got really high consumption and you're asking money to go make an improvement or build a water plant or build a reservoir, you know, and they got another utility next region over that's got water conservation in, in place, they're going to give the money to the other community first. So we're in competition and metering helps us get funding for you. Okay, uh, we talked about water usage. We were saying how much water usage there is per day, about 430 cubes a day, over 1,000 on those big summer days. So sometimes it's hard to picture in your mind how much water is that, right? <coughs> so many of you are probably familiar with what these, we call them totes. It's a one cubic meter tote, 1,000 liters. So that's one cubic meter of water. So we're talking about on an average day, going through 437 of those, sorry, 430 of those, and that works out to 18 totes an hour that we're pumping out of those wells over there. That's an average day, on a peak day, 42 totes an hour we're pumping. That's actually, those wells over there, that's the limit that they can supply. They're going full out right now on those max days to keep up. Like there's, there's no excess capacity on, on those wells, and that's a result of the high irrigation. So I just want you to see that picture in your mind, that tote, that one cubic meter tote. 42 of those an hour we're pumping in the summer. A lot of water. Okay, metering program. It's always important to everybody. Who's paying for this, right? I mentioned we're doing these meter pits. We're trying to maximize those meter pits. They're expensive compared to the inside installation. So the board recognizes the value of uh, implementing meters for all the reasons I've talked about. In 2015, so this was before I got from the TNRD, Strategic Priority Fund grant came available. The TNRD put together an application and submitted it and said, we want to do water metering on a bunch of the uh, utilities owned by the TNRD. Not successful. So the TNRD, you know, as I mentioned, you're competing, we're competing on your behalf or other, against other utilities around the province to try to get funding. 2017, a new grant funding program came open. It's called Federal Gas Tax Funding, F50T. And so we submitted a grant application and on March of 2018, uh, we were told we were successful. We got just shy of three and a half million dollars uh, grant funding to do this program. For those of you who've been uh, customers of utilities before where grant programs have been used for infrastructure, there's a very good chance you've been asked to contribute to the cost. For years and years, it was always federal government would pay a third, the province would pay a third, and the community would pay the other third. This federal gas tax program, extremely rare, this gas tax program covers 100% of eligible costs. This is the first one of these that I've seen in my career. Uh, and there seems to be a bit of a trend that the government's trying to make it easier for communities, small communities in particular, to do these infrastructure improvements. And there's been, there's been this trend of increase. I don't know if that's going to continue. None of us know that. But uh, uh, anyway, so for this project, this water metering project, which is all 11 utilities, uh, we need to have a grant that's covering 100% of the available costs, which is great news for you guys. <laughs> project budget. This is an uh, overall project budget. There's the grant project that I just talked about. Uh, we've had some federal gas tax community works fund that's being contributed uh, to the tune of 150000 Every project, there's some ineligible costs, so that's staff time to go out and fix valves, curb stop valves or something that need to be done in conjunction with the project or anything like that. So that's we're not we're not able to charge our staff time back to the grant program. We don't take out that ineligible cost. So we don't know exactly, but we're estimating maybe two or three percent of the project cost. So anyway, you are not cast in stone these numbers. Well this number is. That's how much they're giving us. This is an estimate. But we're looking at 3.7 million give or take. For, that's all 11 utilities. So it's a pretty big project. Uh, it's going to take us a couple years to do it. So what does the meter look like? Uh, Steve's going to come up in a bit and talk to you about more about the meters, but here's, an, here's a photograph of an inside meter installation. That's the meter itself. So in this case, you know, your service comes in, it could come in through up through the basement floor, could come in through the wall in your crawl space. 
uh, down the hole, obviously, because the lines are in the ground, you can try to keep them from freezing. And the uh, first thing that's there is you'll always find is a shutoff valve. And that's the valve you run to if you've got a leak in your house and plumbing and you've got to shut it off right away, so that's the one. So the meter's always installed right after that shutoff valve. So not after any keys to go off to your irrigation or whatever, right? <laughs> so shutoff valve, water meter. In, sorry, yeah. in this case, there's actually a pressure reducing valve in this photograph. Uh, you may or may not have a pressure reducing valve, that just depends on your service pressure. But we're not, we're not changing anything with regards to that. So there's the meter. The amazing thing about these meters, uh, uh, they're connected to a cellular device. And uh, Steve's going to talk some more about that. But that's how the data gets transmitted, is by cellular, just like a text message. It is, in essence, is like a text message. So that's an in inside installation. So that then gets mounted on the wall or joint, or, you know, your basement or whatever, right close by. Outside installation, oh, I'm sorry, there's a water meter, arrow, forgot I had the zeros on there, cellular endpoint. Outside installation, so this is the majority of the installation. So obviously I can't show you a photograph of something underground, but this is a schematic, shows you a cross section view, so we're looking at it sideways, right? Uh, there's the top measure lawn, your driveway or whatever, preferably your lawn. There's the water main in the road, there's the line coming into your house. So what we do is we basically dig down, we put the weaver pit in, we tee into the service line here, comes up, the meter sits right here, a couple of 21 inches or so below grade, goes to the water goes through the meter, and back down and into your house. There's a little bit of, you see this white line here? That represents a wire going up to a little antenna, basically, a little transmitter, antenna transmitter. Uh, and that sits in the, the this is an iron steel, uh, sort of uh, cast iron frame and lid here on this thing. And so that's how the data gets transmitted uh, to the cellular network. And importantly, in here we have two, two inch thick layers of insulation. And uh, obviously this is uh, a critical piece that we have the insulation in here. But the very first time I saw one of these pits 10, 15 years ago, whatever it I thought these are never gonna work, they're gonna freeze. I just I just had a hard time believing that these things weren't gonna create us a whole pile of problems with, with freeze up. So the way it the way, and turns out was wrong, they, they actually are very effective in not freezing up. The key is, you know, if you're crossing it, maybe it goes down. I mean, this area is not that deep, I guess. The river would go away and be much deeper. But uh, so the the, uh, the key is that the insulation uh, retains as the heat from down below comes up. It's convective, right? Warm air rises. So it's colder up here, it's cool, warmer down here. The warmer air from below kind of floats up, and uh, so it'll keep the meter from freezing. The key point is. These lines, the vertical lines come up the side and the inside of this pipe can't, can't touch the outside. If they get in contact with the outside, they'll make it through these. But they're secured in here with cross brace so that they don't move. Yeah. So it does work, it's improvement effective. Uh, I was wrong. So the shut off. Shut off is going to be, I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, it'll be adjacent to or close to the, to the shut off. So here's a uh, there's a couple, I've got a few photographs to show you of actual installations. This is the actual meter pit. It's basically a flat, big chunk of plastic pipe. It's been fabricated up with all the fittings and pipes and everything inside it. Uh, this is like, uh, now Iconics, it was Corex. This is a uh, Corex truck. Their company changed names. Uh, and the work is typically done with a mini excavator. So, this is a photograph here of one that was done in the oral system just, just in the fall before for winter. And these things, there's a pit in the background there. You can see it laying on the grass. And so they get installed. And basically, that's all you're going to see at the surface. That's the lid I was talking about. And if you see that, look closely right there. That's the little antenna that I was talking about. Actually, our lid's a little, a little different than this because the antenna is actually mounted just underneath it. So you won't even see it. It's just on the bottom side of that. So that's all you see. It's only, it's only about this big around. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Steve Cooper. He's going to talk. He's with the uh, mention iconics. He's going to talk about the meter and technology. Okay. Uh, so, the, why 
widen your strands of the data by, so it's, uh, in this particular case, LTE, and this is the transmitter here. It'll transmit the data once per day uh, as a quick little text message first, usually two, three o'clock in the morning and stuff. It is in constant contact to the meter. The meter sends its reading to the transmitter, and that's where it stores the information for this transmitter. It stores a reading all the way down every 15 minutes in the transmitter. The, they'll have flags on here for leak detection, reverse flow, things like that. Uh, the meters themselves are uh, gobbled down all the way to a tenth of a liter. So they very accurately detect the smallest amount of flow in any direction. So the meters are made by a company called Badger Water Meters. They're located in Wisconsin, they're made in Milwaukee. The meters itself are all polymer. They are MSF 61, so they're no lead in them, and they have no moving parts. They're called an ultrasonic meter. So if you can look, you can see some stuff in there, but that's just the sensors. There is no moving parts. So you can walk here on some of these other brands of clicking or clacking or anything like that. Uh, they're all one piece. It's electronically potted. It's got a battery there, and it's good for about 20 years. Uh, the IO water system is how you guys will be able to read get your information from the users. It's a website uh, or your Android iOS uh, apps. Just go down, it's I and water. I tell everybody I make sure it's an I like your eye. And you go out and with the information from the TRD if you can see your usage, just your usage for the previous 24 hours. It has alerts on there for telling you leads and everything else so you can track your trends and see all the way down to 15 minutes. So you can see your average usage here for seven days. You can see a graph with your usage per hour. Uh, this is a day, showing a month per day, how much you use. And you can nail it down to a day, or first of all, you can really flag per hour, and the note saying current seven days, previous seven days, and you'll be able to see your own track usage. So here's some screenshots as I was saying. So you can see them far left there, it has leak detected. That will show up if there's actually a leak. You'll see your usage down there, current seven days, previous seven days, and you'll see your usage here per week, day, month, year, whatever you selected. And here's a year, I uh, showed a couple months and you can see which days you use more or less. Steve. And just to mention again, the, the text message, basically, think of it as a text, a text message, gets sent from this once every 24 hour period, I think around midnight, or just a... It, it varies, depends on what's set or it's usually yeah. So it will, it will transmit the data uh, to the cell network and it goes to, uh, to a beacon server. That, that's how you get access to it through your app on your phone or your tablet or your computer and that sort of thing. It's the same data that we gather at the office. So in terms of implementation, uh, the RFP for request for proposals that we put out to supply and installation of the meters, we did that last spring, March. And uh, so Iconics obviously was the winning proponent and the installations we commenced last fall and work is ongoing. As I mentioned, it's gonna take probably a couple year period uh, to get all 11 systems completed. So I just want to give you a little bit of information about my personal experience with water meters. This is my house in Kamloops. I've lived there for about 20 years, just over 20 years. So when I moved to Kamloops, uh, there were no water meters. And uh, shortly after I moved in, I put in an underground irrigation system. This is a pretty average sized house, and that's why I want to use it as an example. It's certainly average in, in the uh, Kamloops area. I have 300 square meters of lawn. Since I'm an engineer, I measured it a photo, your photo. But it's, it is a very average sized lot. So, Sydney Kamloops brought in water meters about, it took a number of years to bring them all in, but it was about eight to 10 years ago. So, I had my underground irrigation system installed long before the, the meters came. And I, after a couple summers, I kind of figured out how much, how long to run each zone in my yard for irrigation. So 
So fast forward a few years, meters came in, meter got installed. I intentionally did not change my water consumption at all for two years. Because I thought, I'm an average customer. I want to see how the meter affects my bill based on the rates that the city set. Two year period, my annual total bill over you know, the four quarters that I paid, at the end of the year when I added up those payments, I was within $20 of what I was paying the four meters. So this is the whole point. For the average customer, the meter are going to have next to no impact in terms of what you should be being charged per year. If you're using less, you could potentially save money. If you're using a lot more, you may pay more. But the average customer, and we don't know what each of you individually use, all we know is what the average is, because we know how many services there are and we know how much water we pump every day, right? So that's, I just want to give you that message that, you know, the, the intent here is to keep the average person at the same rate. That's the way we're going to try to do this, right? And uh, so my personal example, I think, is really important. The other thing I want to mention is, before we had meters, uh, I was, uh, first year or two, I put the irrigation system in. We had a really hot summer, and I was, you know, in early August, I guess it was, in August, my front lawn started to take out. It's south-facing. I couldn't get it to green up, and I started, I jacked, started jacking up my irrigation timer. I was irrigating like crazy, trying to get it green again. You know, the gentleman that lives in this great house on the right side, he came over and left in the yard one day, he came over and said, Jake, you're just wasting water. You're not going to get your laundry by just pounding the water to it. He said, go put a little fertilizer on it. That's what I did. And of course, I turned green like crazy and I just wait out of water. So, anyway, it's, it's the truth. It's my story, my story. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's represented. And, uh, uh, I'm trying to relieve you of your concerns if, you're, if you are concerned that water meters are a bad thing for the community. Okay, in terms of uh, installations going forward, as I mentioned, we're going to have mostly outside meters and a few inside ones. If you have a, if you're going to be uh, have, a, have a meter installed on an inside installation, you're going to get a letter. Well, you're going to get a letter regardless, but the letter will contain information about how to schedule an appointment for he and his guys to come in and install the water meter in your house. Obviously, you can set up that appointment to your phone number or email, whatever. You don't need to write this down. It'll be in the letter you get. However, most of you are going to get a letter for an outside installation. Uh, and that letter will be a little different. We don't, we don't need to make an appointment, obviously. We can, we can do that without an appointment. It'll have information in there for the, for the property owner, no appointment necessary. And uh, the gentleman here mentioned about the curb stop. So we can install the meter pit immediately before your curb stop. So let me back up. Everybody probably knows that out on your front property line, or really close to your front property line, there's a little black valve that's about this big around, about four, four inches in diameter you see in your lawn or in your driveway. That's about, they call that a curb stop valve. That's the shut off for the service into your house. So we can put the water meter pit either just before that or just after it. It's better for both of us to have it just after it Obviously, because if there's a problem with the meter pit, then you can just shut the curb stop off. We don't have to go out and try to shut the main off any road. And uh, so it, it makes it easier for the installation, it makes it easier for maintenance and uh, repair if necessary going forward. Uh, on the topic of repair, uh, we continue to own and operate and maintain the meters. Uh, as you as an owner, all you need to do, if it's inside, which is not many of you, uh, basically, don't let it freeze and don't mess with it. That's the well, same as the pipe. You know, the pipe that goes into the meter, the pipe that goes out of the meter. You obviously don't want that to freeze, otherwise, you get no water in your house. So, the meter is no different. Don't let it freeze. Uh, but if there's a faulty meter, we replace it. The meter is still the property of the PNRD. But to get back to the meter pin insulation, if you're get a letter, if you're outside install, then you can send form in there and it'll ask you, do you consent to how, allow us to put the meter in just after the curb stop on your property uh, out front? As I mentioned, it's better. You don't have to sign that consent. We prefer it if you do because, it, as I mentioned, it's better for both of us. If you refuse, we'll install the meter just before the curb stop. Uh, deal with it. 
price is the same for us and our contract with Iconics, uh, but it is, it is better to have an actor. So that's one of the things unique about the outside installation. It can go either side. So uh, hopefully, I've, for those of you that thought meters are bad or think meters are bad or are not sure, hopefully I've alleviated some of your concerns. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Yes, sir, the far back, you have your hand up first. So. Where is right behind you, sir? There's a gentleman behind you. Nick, um, you say that all, all uh, users of the water system will be paid, is that correct? All, all users of the water system pay mm -hmm. now and they'll continue to pay. Does that include Cooks Ferry Band? Yes. Cooks Ferry yeah. Band are already metered. Okay. And there are uh, actually 10 water meters on the Cooks Ferry Indian Band, let's call it, portion of the system. And uh, there's four air one through the well, so there's one mini meter that goes to that whole area, and there's nine other meters throughout the community, so they're already there. Okay, thank you. And what about the railways? They have an accident standpipe up here. Are they going to be metered as well? If, uh, if, if it's an active account, yes. If it's an inactive account, it's, an inactive, it's not a valid service, and it should be shut off. So every, well, there's, there's every, an agreement with every, every service. For the railways. There is an agreement with TNRD. My freedom of information uh, told me two or three years ago that uh, CNCP and uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Air pay about fifteen hundred dollars a year combined for un and track running operations for unlimited access to that water system. Okay, there's no such thing as unlimited access. Every service will be needed. Including the rest. Every service will be needed. Okay. Do they play the same rates as we do? The rates uh, have not been determined yet. Uh, that's where we're in the, we're just in the early stages. We've got to do each utility independently. So we're going through the process of calculating how to set the rates. Mm -hmm. But the rates will be the same whether the water is going to you or to the hotel or to the railway. They'll be, uh, the rate will be the rate. And I uh, have two more questions for you. The uh, Census Group follows the fire department. Uh, uh, for every service is going to be metered. For firefighting purposes? Uh, water for firefighting purposes is not metered. And practices? Water for firefighting purposes is, is not metered, but for practices, uh, depending on the setup, we'll have to look at each setup and we can do that. Okay. Okay, so and, uh, that, uh, we've got more than that. So I'm going to just give out a question and then move on to that. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you said that the uh, TNRD does not trespass on private property, is that correct? Yes. Okay, well, in June of 2018. Okay. We're here to talk about the water meters. If you want to talk to us, we've got to have a practice. We're not going to get into something. TNRD trespass on SDIP property. We have $1,500 damage to the underground sprinkler control box that everybody here had to pay for. And TNRD yes, refused to compensate the community for that $1,400. Please sit down. I'm not going to sit down. I'm asking you a question. I have the floor. Will you answer the question, question, please? Will TNRD compensate this community the $1,400 that we incurred as a result of your people? I'm here. Yes, I'm here. 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 Excuse me, this is an information meeting. But it's not a debate, not a public forum. It was advertised as an information meeting. So, what is the rate per cubic meter, thousand meter, even as a ballpark? Okay, I'm not going to give you a, a dollar and cents number today. As I mentioned, it's a we're, we're in the process. We're just getting well into that process of calculating what the rates are going to be. Ballpark. And, and uh, there's, that I, that I can tell you this. We're going to have what's called, most likely we're going to have an, what's called an incline block rate. So the basic indoor usage is there will be no volume that you charge for that. So in other words, we're going to try and figure out what the average indoor use. This is for each utility is independent, by the way. Right? So if, the rates in Spencer Bridge might be slightly different than in Loon Lake or, or Ashcroft or wherever. We so, have a ballpark figure. Okay, I'm just said I don't have numbers. Who dollars you going to it? Dollars and cents, I don't have those numbers for you today. Well, well you, you got to show them there. Yeah. Sorry. 
Are there any questions? Any other questions? Can you guess what's shown here a graph of daily usage at 1900 meters, roughly 2 cubic meters? What's the ballpark figure for a cubic meter? It's a simple question. I'm not going to give you that. Is it two dollars? Because I don't have that today. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, no, that's the most important information you need. Sure. Yeah, I'm not a question here. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Okay, I was trying to explain. Uh, we're, we anticipate. Now, keep in mind, we're just starting into this analysis of how to set the rates. But, and then ultimately, the board, TNRD board of directors, your elected officials, will make the decision as to whether to approve the, you know, how to, whether, whether they agree with what we are proposing for rates, right? They're the decision makers. So, we're going to do our work and we're going to bring forward to them recommendations. Our recommendations are from the most level survey might like be an incline block rate. So basically the first level of all you need water you use per billing cycle, there'll be no charge for that water. That's we're gonna try to set that as your indoor usage. Then anything beyond that, there'll be a, a volumetric charge will apply, so much per cubic meter or liter or whatever you want to call it, right? And we're gonna to try to set that to, you know. Uh, a reasonable level that's not going to have a big impact. But then once you go beyond sort of a reasonable level of irrigation, okay. then you go into the next block and you can start paying a higher rate. So, this so is it's, called an a -line. it's called an incline block rate, and the more you go up and you start getting, if you really, really like consumer, you're going to start paying more per year. Yeah, so also we're going to thank you for that title on that. Uh, so once we get these meters in, we're going to, uh, we'll have these uh, rates, we're going to do our analysis, and we'll take that to the floor as they approve it. And we're going to implement a phase in period where we, we send you the bill based on the standard billing rate. We're going to continue with that, but we're going to include information about how much water you've used on that account and what that billing would look like after we flip over to meter rates. So you'll have a period of time. You're going to continue to pay the flat rate, but you're going to be informed about how much you're using and what that bill will look like after the fact. So you'll have an opportunity, if you so desire, to adjust your And Jake, I'll add to that real quick. So the board has already had this conversation, and what we've discussed is we're sort of, like Jake says, one system like the Del Oro and the Spencer's Bridge are much different. So you're going to do 11 different unique systems. So we're going to take staff recommendations and experts as a board, and we're going to say, try to get as close to zero as you can. And then when we go to that second tier, there will only be two tiers. That when we go to the second tier at usage, we'll see where that lands. And then after a year, a summer, we'll revisit that because we may have missed the mark a bit. We may have missed a low, we may have missed it high, but we want to try at the end of the day. So the board has already had this discussion where we're not going to be probably perfect on all 11 systems. But Steve, so just so you know. Steve, you can't even give us a ballpark figure. Like if we take $2 a cubic meter, fair? The systems are going to be different because there's different usage with all 11 systems. But, but how can we budget for what we're going to pay? If, if the graph just shown us 1,900 liters per person per day, that's, that's right. two cubic meters. At two dollars like a cubic meter, I'm not that's, any, yeah, that's four you know, bucks. We don't have that information either, Hank. So you know, it's everything to us. Yeah, but, it's, but that's not what we're that's 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 Okay, so I think what we're trying to do here is. We probably we heard the word transparency in all kinds of uh, government stuff and everything else. Everybody, we want to be transparent. I think the question is, what units does it measure the water in, and what's the unit worth? Okay, the, the water meter will measure to a tenth of a liter, correct, Steve? Tenth of a liter. Tenth of a liter. Tenth of a liter. And uh, so with the count that comes on the graph that we can see on our phone, the graph, does that show us how many liters we've used yes. or how many cubic meters we've used? Both. 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 And some, at some point, you're going to be able to give us a price on what that number of liters is worth. So that when we look at our cell phone, we can say, oh, this is what we can expect to pay this month. 
Okay. That will be available yeah. to us. The rate, the rate will be based on, on uh, cubic meters. A liter is just too small of a volume, right? So we're going to do it on cubic meters. So we'll, we'll be setting rates based on cubic meters. And you can look at your app every day and see your consumption. So once you know, once yes. you told us what the value is, yes. it'll, it'll coincide with what we use. Yep, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, when we were back to the graph, the very first graph you showed. You want me to back it up there? That's okay. Um, you showed us the line for household use, and then you showed us the line of leakage, and it was more than household use. No, that was an add on. Add on. Add on. Okay, okay, yeah. so I'm looking at yeah. it. What? How can we leak yeah. more than we use this? Yeah. I'm sorry, I maybe should have clarified that. That's the internet. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. 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 Um, I own the hotel next door, so mm -hmm. ours is a commercial application. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Would you explain to me how that's going to work for us? Yep. Because we consume large quantities of water in the summer, yep. but we're closed for five months. So we consume the same as a residential. My wife and I do get it. Yep. How's that going to affect our work? Yep. So, uh, as I mentioned, the, the charge is going to be volumetric. So, if, whether the water goes into a hotel or a restaurant or a community hall or a house, the rate will be the same because it's the cost of production and so forth, right? It, it, it's ultimately, it's not, in terms of billing purposes, it doesn't matter which tap it's coming out of, right? It's all volume, it's going to be volume based, right? So there'll be, there'll be a flat rate based on the size of your service, so, and then a meter grade on top of that, right? And so, as I mentioned, there'll be an incline block rate. And so if you're using less in the winter, then you know if those quarters during the winter will be less, and in the summer you're using more, it'll be more. But as I mentioned, for the average customer, we're going to set these rates so that the average customer is the same as they're paying now. Is it, is it commercial? We're not, there won't be a different rate for commercial versus residential. Sorry, I should have just got to that point. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, does that mean that if people choose to pay more, they just pay more? Are there going to be um, like hours of you know like restrictions? The restrictions will stay in place okay. because that's beneficial in terms of you know you don't you get less evaporation, less wastage. So, but the as I mentioned, the you know there'll be if you have a almost all the services are three quarter inch, right? That's pretty much uniform. But there are there are a few exceptions for larger services, and they'll be. Basically the same type of meter, same technology, just a big, bit bigger meter, and it's still the volumetric rate. So the base rate for the larger service is higher, and then the volume is the volume. If, if it's a thousand liters into a hotel or about, sorry, ten liters, whatever, cubic meters, sorry, ten cubic meters into a hotel or ten cubic meters into a residential property, the charge for that volume of water is the same. Yes, Mr. Jake, does this uh, meter monitor, does that replace the flat rate billing that we get? Or is it an addition to it? It, it replaces it. So we're going to, your tax bill will be eliminated and the water meters will take over? So you're, you're, quarter, you're billed quarterly now, you'll be billed quarterly later, not when we are on the meter system. It's just basically how is the amount of that bill calculated? Instead of being a flat rate, like I talked about, everybody's single family dwelling all getting the same. Now it's going to be varying based on usage, and if you're an average person, you should see little to no change. Okay. Yes, sir. Hypothetically, if the volume goes down, if our peak, yeah. if our peak level goes down, yeah. then the average would be going down for everybody, right? Yeah, well, like in, in theory, yeah. In right. theory, yeah, in theory. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, you know, as I say, we're going to do our best Best analysis we can at rate setting, and you know, if we start, we get out and we get these, we get the meter rates going, and in a year cycle, we find out, oh, we we've, we've overestimated, you know, we've, we've set the rate a bit high, like maybe we've we've over uh, estimated the uh, uh, what the number should be. Keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, that year the money just goes into your collective bank account reserve. And we probably make an adjustment and bring that rate down to try to get it, right? So we're we're staying at the same revenue because this isn't about additional revenue. No, but it, you did say point number two was conservation, right? Absolutely. That's so if, if we yeah. reach conservation levels, yeah. then our at our average bill should be reduced. 
Well, <laughs> you still have to make a statement. <laughs> so what you're saying is it's not an impossible thing. No, no. I find Bill and the city cameras never went down. But I, I, I mean, like, Bill's never going to go down. I think it's amazing. Don't expect this to be a hard thing. But I'm guaranteed to share with you that this is. This will benefit oh, oh. in the bigger picture longer term. He said, I'm clean. I'm more money to write. I know it's for a fact that the city you know why I don't have whatever has gone up a lot more than it has in the last few years. There was a great story in, in the Congress of the State last summer on this exact topic, and the city was talking about how much it's a benefit and what it's a consistent ability to have those in play. Okay. Can I duck? Yep.